All right, here we are. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to be, so be presenting a timely webinar entitled Building Asian American and Black Solidarity for Racial Justice in Today's America. Uh, my name is Jamaica Miles. I am the co-founder of All of Us Community Action Group um, and pleased to be a part of this conversation with this esteemed group of panelists. Um, today is sponsored by the ABA Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice and Coalition on Racial and Ethnic Justice. This panel is one of many in a series commemorating Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. The ABA is actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues, so please feel free to visit theamericanbar.org uh, for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions. We want participation, but you're gonna do that through the Q&A. If you are participating through Zoom, look for the Q&A, not the chat function. If you don't see the controls, you might have to like move your mouse around to be able to see where that is. Um, and we'll then address those questions at the end of the program. We will be sharing this, per this recording uh, to everyone who has registered. So for anyone that joins late, we'll be sure to get the full recording. And then you also can share it widely with your networks. And with that, right, there's the brief intro. Let's talk about who's on our panel today and go ahead and get started um, with this panel discussion on building Asian American and black solidarity for racial justice in today's America. And joining us today, we have Sunu Chandy, legal director for the National Women's Law Center, Vinay Harpalani, um, of the Henry Wehofen Professor and Associate Professor of Law, University of New York of New Mexico School of Law, the longest title, the one I was most likely to mess up. Um, Sholana Lewis, who is the Director for Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Kalamazoo, and Frank Wu, who is the President of Queens College at the City University of New York. And so let's go ahead and get started and get to know our panelists a little bit better and what brings them to this conversation and how they relate to the topic. And I wanna start with you, Sunu. Thank you so much, Jamaica. I wanna thank my former colleague, Janelle George, for the invitation to take part in this event and thank everyone who's involved in supporting and planning it. Uh, this is session and all the other sessions this month and I want to thank my colleagues, Elizabeth Tang and Phoebe Wolf for pulling together some of the materials and my friend, Marie Varghese. So we're going to have about five minutes each to introduce ourselves and with a little bit of a longer introduction. This was, so I was telling my spouse a lot harder to prepare for than my legal presentations, um, racial identity and how we relate in community to um, Black Americans and to other Asian Americans in this moment is a very challenging topic and one I think about a lot in relation to my work as the legal director at the National Women's Law Center. We're a gender justice organization, but to do the work of women's rights, we must be equally committed to racial justice, disability justice, immigrant rights, and to all of the issues that we care about equally. So I first began to identify as a woman of color and a queer woman of color. And my parents are immigrants from Kerala, India. I'm gonna start with this um, excerpt from a poem which related to how during the last um, few years in this country, I'm going to put the link here and I'm only going to be doing um, an excerpt from it, but you can read the rest of it later. The last few years in this country, I think, have been tough for obviously for Black Americans, but also for many of us who care about civil rights. And the part three of this poem goes like this. Questions to a place. I'm wondering if the whole country is turning into 1979, small town Ohio again. A white gazebo in the center of town, one traffic light. It's a 12 mile journey to the nearest grocery store. Friday evenings in the summer, we head to Hillsboro to Frisch's Big Boy for ice cream sundaes once uncle finishes his shift. The farmers ask my father to pray for rain or sun depending. Mostly, I claim the lilac bushes and my tire swing in the front yard, the tomato plants and the three kinds of roses in the back. Though something doesn't smell right, 
With our American flag in the window, we try to belong to a place where there are none of us. We left that behind, but now it is 2017. America, will you try to call me Sue again? Will you tell me that I speak English well again? Will you ask me for my papers again? Will you say, I don't know where you come from, but in this country, we have freedom of speech when I tell the three male attorneys to stop sexually harassing a young woman. America, will you say, hey, N-word again on College Avenue? Will you call me Hindi and ask me about Indian restaurants? America, does my spouse no longer have a pronoun again? Are we going back to this? Are you going back to, you're pretty well for an Indian? No, but really though, where are you from? So I thought I would introduce myself with that poem and just to say the dynamics of sort of growing up actually on the island of Jamaica for a few years and then also in very small town Ohio and how those sort of dynamics interrelated with each other. And then when we left Ohio, we went to Chicago where everyone said, um, it is a gang infested place. And so I lived in this place for many formative years where I understood that we were other and less than, but I also understood that black Americans were treated even worse than we were. And so how those dynamics related to each other. So obviously I'll say more when it's my turn to present. I wanted to start with that sort of opening. Thank you. No, thank you. I mean, what a great opening, um, not only just to learn a little bit more about who you are, but to bring such life with that poetry. I appreciate it personally. Um, so, Vinay, what brings you to this? <laughs> well, uh, thank you for having me. You know, that was uh, beautiful, Sumo. Um, uh, you know, I think I relate to some of those experiences also, and I'll just uh, you know, tell my uh, story, uh, what I call my critical race autobiography. I've written a little essay on this too, which I'll put in the chat later. Uh, but I'm a South Asian American. Uh, my parents immigrated from India, uh, late 1960s. Uh, I was born here in the US. Uh, my dad came over on the third preference of the 1965 Immigration Act. Uh, he was an engineer. And that act, as I'll talk about in my uh, full presentation, I gave preference to scientists uh, and engineers. Uh, he settled, uh, my, my family settled in Delaware uh, because of DuPont. My dad was an engineer, as I said. Uh, and Delaware, growing up in Delaware, uh, was a big influence on me. Delaware is kind of a, at the border of the North and the South. Uh, so a lot of interesting racial dynamics there. When I was growing up, there were very few South Asian Americans in Delaware. It was a very black and white state. Uh, and also, right as I started school in the late 1970s, Newcastle County, Delaware implemented what was probably the most comprehensive school desegregation plan in the entire country, uh, metropolitan busing. Uh, you may remember a couple of years ago when uh, Joe Biden uh, was uh, in the Democratic presidential primary, this came up as an issue, his position on busing. Uh, I grew up with that. Uh, so, you know, I, I grew up with those uh, dynamics. Uh, our schools, public schools were mandated, had to be 70% white, 30% black by court order, by federal court order. Uh, and I was South Asian American growing up in this context. People didn't know exactly what I was. Uh, you know, my uh, autobiographical essay talks about what I call racial ambiguity, uh, kind of being identified differently in different contexts. So, you know, I was called uh, Japanese beetle. And, you know, I guess I was the, look, the closest thing to Japanese uh, in uh, Delaware. Uh, and this was around the time I, I learned later on when there was a lot of competition in the automotive industry between the US and Japan, there was a big Chrysler plant right there in Delaware. So, uh, you know, these kids that were calling me this, they were kindergartners, uh, you know, I wonder where they learned that from. Uh, later on during the Persian Gulf War, you know, what was the insult? Uh, this is like 1991, Saddam, you know, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of the anti-Iraqi sentiment there and a number of others uh, that I write about. Uh, uh, so, you know, later on, I reflected on this. Uh, I also, you know, like I said, Delaware, very black and white at the time. So I had to find a place for myself. And uh, kind of, I think, you know, alluding to what Sunu said, I always kind of felt like I fit in better with the black kids. Uh, just, uh, it was kind of the racial dynamic. I, find the, I found those social spaces to be more open, uh, less cliquish. I also played basketball. So a lot of racial dynamics, racial stereotypes there. 
Uh, and I kind of, you know, uh, was aware of that kind of, you know, saw how I felt playing basketball kind of felt like I was stereotyped as, as not as good. Uh, and eventually reflecting on that, you know, I mean, that kind of sucks when you're at the basketball court and, and no one wants to be on your team. Uh, but I thought about, you know, well, how do black kids feel in the classroom? You know, maybe very similar to the way I feel there. And how does that affect them? You know, um, so I was kind of able to reflect on all those racial dynamics. Uh, then I went to the University of Delaware. Uh, for undergraduates. Uh, and suddenly we had a big change here. You know, my schooling had always been, as I said, around 70% white, 30% black, you know, more than a critical mass of black students. University of Delaware, early 1990s was over 90% white. So I was there, uh, you know, I was uh, going there. I did well academically, but something seemed missing to me. And, you know, I wasn't in the black spaces when I went to University of Delaware, but I knew, you know, something ain't right here. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know eventually I figured it out. Uh, you know, undergrad, I was a pre-med student, a kind of stereotypical, quote unquote, model minority, which I will again talk about in my uh, larger presentation. But eventually, you know, I realized, uh, you know, I'm really interested in race issues, reflecting on all the things I just talked about. Uh, and when I started graduate school, uh, you know, that's uh, what I got into. I was studying racial, racial identity, uh, studied racial stereotypes, the very stereotypes that I, I talked about earlier, uh, something that I lived. Eventually, I got into uh, what's called critical race theory. Uh, and, you know, that's a big part of the legal academy, uh, originated in the legal academy. Uh, you know, I was thinking about going to uh, law school. And, uh, you know, uh, I actually met Frank Wu at that time, uh, and, you know, talked about becoming a law professor. And many years later, you know, here I am. So, you know, conversation with Frank uh, helped, helped me go in that direction. Um, so, you know, kind of reflecting on my childhood experiences, when we never talked about race, you know, I was in a desegregated school, uh, you know, uh, mandatory court ordered busing. Uh, when I was in uh, uh, nursery school, really, that's when it started, nursery school, kindergarten, uh, there were national guardsmen uh, present there just to make sure there was no rioting or violence or anything like that. And, and there wasn't, uh, you know, people eventually accepted it uh, in spite of the opposition. Uh, but it was reflecting on all that many years later uh, because we never talked about race uh, when I was in school, that I came to do uh, what I do now. Thank you for that. Um, we're already way deeper into this conversation than I imagined we would be in just such a short amount of time. Um, as we're talking about, you know, Black solidarity, um, Asian American solidarity in today's society, um, Shalana, introduce us to yourselves and to us and let us know what brings you to this. Yes, thank you so much. And I just want to acknowledge how beautiful um, both of your stories were. Um, I love opening with story and the healing work. Um, we spend a lot of time telling stories, um, and particularly the stories of how we got to where we are. And it's so formative um, for us, especially in racial justice work. It's always deeply personal, always deeply personal. So I just want to thank the organizers for opening with this question. Um, who am I? How did I get here to this work? Um, I can really relate to what's been shared already about um, feeling like we, when you, when people don't know how to place you, when society doesn't know how to place you, it can cause all kinds of problems for you. Um, I actually grew up in a, um, a lot of different places between Michigan and Texas. Um, and as a, a black person, a brown skinned person, I also have a white mother. And so um, this was a huge challenge for me growing up because not, not anything to do with my mother, but people did not know how to place me. They thought I was adopted. Um, and I just didn't really fit because I was the only black girl for uh, miles and miles and miles. <laughs> um, and that really impacted me, but um, I did have an opportunity as a young person in middle school to move um, from Northern Michigan, Upper Peninsula to Houston, Texas, right? One of the most diverse cities in the whole country. And I think that was so amazing for me to, to be around um, in that environment. And, and I think one of the biggest stories I tell folks is, you know, in Houston, I had the blessing and privilege of having friends in my high school from all over the world, really. Um, I had a, a early friendships with folks, uh, as soon as I got there, uh, with folks who were Korean. I, I had friends that were uh, 
from Thailand. I had friends from Tunisia, from from Lebanon, from and of course, pretty much any country in South America and Central America that you can name. Um, we're all surrounded. Um, and I think for me, that has been so important and something I recall all the time because it really shaped, you know, it shaped me, it shaped how I felt about myself and my own identity. Um, and I think it's so important that because we live in such a segregated world, most of us, um, we just don't get that type of exposure and get to develop those deep relationships from an early age. Um, and so I know that I think was part of what really drove me into this work, um, thinking about race um, because of all of that. Um, and I also wanna bring in my, my big sister who's also biracial and quite a bit older than me. Um, and she uh, put a book in my hand when I was about 13, I think, uh, Things Fall Apart. Um, and I think that has been um, a really formative uh, piece for me because reading that as a young adult also just opened my mind to really asking critical questions. Um, and I loved, uh, I loved how it was shared that, you know, as, as we ask, and as we explore our own, our own experiences, we ask ourselves, uh, how are peop other people experiencing the same type of dynamic, maybe in a different way? And, and that was just beautiful because I really got to see firsthand um, and it really made me question everything about you know, society and what the expectations were of me and what the assumptions were of me. Um, and also seeing how those assumptions played out amongst my friends, right? And so, I think that was extremely um, influential to me. Um, and some of my best teachers were also, again, from all over the world. Um, and I think my my experience, even though my school was termed underprivileged and, uh, you know, underperforming, I had uh, an amazing, and it, it doesn't even, by the way, my high school does not actually exist anymore, <laughs> unfortunately, um, as it was, Lee High School, um, ironically named after you know, the general Confederate general. Um, I had so many teachers um, and I had just had a huge privilege to be in that type of environment um, that so many people don't have. So um, that's what I wanted to bring into this space today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're just, we're continuing on with these amazing first looks at um, our panelists and hearing what brings you to this work and this space today. Uh, so Frank Wu, round us out. What brings you here today? Sure. So I've uh, always uh, done this sort of work since the killing of Vincent Chin, a Chinese American uh, in 1982 in Detroit. He was bludgeoned to death uh, by two white auto workers who shouted racial slurs and obscenities before blaming him for the success of Japanese cars. And they cracked his head open with a baseball bat. Uh, they always admitted that they had committed the act, but they denied that it was motivated by bias. Uh, they couldn't very well de deny that they had done it because there were dozens of witnesses, uh, but they were aggrieved that they were being called racist. So that was formative for me as a, as a teenager and ultimately led me to Howard University, the nation's leading historically black institution of higher education. I was the first Asian American to be a law professor there. And the truth is I learned as much as I taught and I'd like to share a, a bit of what I learned. It made me realize the prejudice I have, despite myself, we, we all do. We just have images rattling around in the back of our head, whether we're aware of it or not. The unconscious uh, bias, the implicit bias, the, the subtle sorts of impulses that we might have. Uh, and then we catch ourselves and we realize, wow, I, I just, committed a microaggression, even though that's not what I intended and though I do this work. None of us is immune. The question is what we will do once we become aware of it. I also saw privilege, my own privilege that I enjoyed without ever having been aware of it. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. You know, we don't want to compare suffering. There's no winner in that contest. But when I walk down the street, until recently, the worst that would happen to me is some kid would come up to me and try to challenge me to a Kung Fu match, right? Even if I'm wearing a coat and tie, they're pretty sure I got that black belt on, on and I'm a karate champion, right? So they'd howl and hiss, it'd be ching chong something or the other. It, it was a joke, it was trivial for them. They didn't realize how traumatic it was when I was their age and it led to real fights. 
And yes, we've now all seen the viral videos of elderly Asians being spit on, shoved to the ground so hard that their bones are broken, being stabbed, being shot, and that, that's terrible. We need to do something about that. Yet, I wonder if we can extend our empathy beyond those whom we consider our people who look like us. What I mean is when I was at Howard, I, I noticed that my colleagues, my students, my, my friends, whether they were male or female, if they were black, when they walked down the street, people sometimes crossed to the other side. They had a panic look if they were white. They scurried along a little faster. They were being mistaken for thugs and purse snatchers. Um, and people could signal that without even saying a word. Now, I'm not saying every single time, but as I got to know my black colleagues and students, I realized, you know, it did happen to them every day. And the image that attached to them was one of black criminality. And we've now also seen those viral videos, not just the terrible, tragic murder of Mr. George Floyd, but so many others that make me realize if you're black and you're out jogging, you might be hunted down by people who even make a video for themselves of killing you because they think they'll be able to get away with it. You can be bird watching in Central Park. And if you're going to stereotype, you know, I bet bird watchers are a pretty peaceful bunch, but people will call 911 and say that you're attacking them. So being at Howard made me aware in a way that no study of any book could, that there is a historic struggle for black equality that I'm indebted to. Asian Americans wouldn't even be here if it weren't for that struggle. I'll explain why that is. Uh, in 1964, Congress passed the Historic Civil Rights Act. You, you know that as lawyers. Before that act passed, you could discriminate. It was legal. It was normal. You could say to people, I'm sorry, we don't hire your type. I'm sorry, we don't hire women. We're, we're not going to rent to you. And if someone sued, they would lose because that wasn't a thing, as kids would say. Well, 1964, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act. In 1965, they passed the Immigration and Nationality Act. That's how most Asian Americans were able to come. They weren't able to come before 1965 because if you go all the way back to 1917, the system that was put into place had an Asiatic barred zone. It was chipped away over time and amended, but it wasn't until 1965 that a new era of fairness and an open door, uh, or to the critics, floodgates uh, were, were open. And so the 64 Civil Rights Act led directly to the 65 Immigration Act. That is the connection. It's not just rhetoric. I can point you to actual legislation. I'll close by saying I also saw the color line marked out so clearly you couldn't deny it. I was at Howard for 10 years, for a decade. It's actually where most of my teaching career was. Not quite every day, but every week somebody would say to me, white folks, sometimes Asian as well, but never, not once was it anyone who was black. They would say to me, gee, what, what are you doing there? Do you like it? Are you some sort of radical? Are you just into hip hop? Is this a political statement? Couldn't you get a job anywhere else? What are, what are black students like? Are they any good? Are you comfortable around them? And sometimes people would look at me and then stammer, are you black? Because they were so puzzled. It was remarkable to them. I wasn't doing it right. I was assimilating the wrong way. My wife, who's also Asian American and a law professor, she'd been teaching longer than me, so she outranks me, as she points out from time to time, taught at another fine school across town that was predominantly white. Now, no one talks about it that way. It's just a normal, regular mainstream school. And as an Asian American among whites, you want to know how often she was asked, are you comfortable? Is this a political statement? Couldn't you get a job somewhere else? Literally never, not once. So what did I learn from that? It's a little social science experiment. If you're Asian American and you're hanging out with black folks, people are just curious. Maybe they're not bigots, but they want to know what's going on here. You know, did, did you not get the memo? But if you're Asian American and you're among whites, hey, congratulations, you're upwardly mobile. You've made it. That's what you're supposed to be doing. So that's what brings me to this work. Oh my goodness. Uh, so as we begin, we've not even begun to have a conversation about building Asian American and black solidarity 
for racial justice today in this America, yet look at all of the wealth of knowledge from lived experience that we've already brought up, right? As we're about to dig deeper into different areas um, because we are talking about the history of the United States, right? Um, and the fact that there are the first that we have to have, the first Asian American, the first black. Uh, the labels that each of you have talked about in your lived experiences, the boxes that were put in myself as a black woman with a white mom, um, being told who I am and who I'm not, and how that applies to the othering that each of you have described in your own lived experiences, um, and oppression and oppression Olympics and <laughs> microaggressions, like all of those different pieces that you've already started to unearth before we've even made it through 25 minutes. Um, so I personally want to say thank you for starting the conversation this way and being vulnerable and sharing those pieces with all of us. Um, but let's go ahead and dig a little bit deeper, right? Because there are a lot of issues that this applies to when we look for how do we come together and to realize that it's not the first time that there has been Asian American and Black solidarity. And we just need to make that a larger part of the work that we're doing right now. So I do wanna start with you, Frank. You just got done, but it's not over. Um, can you talk to us about coalition building and the historical connection? And I always love a good PowerPoint, so thank you. Yeah. There we go. A after 13 months, you would figure uh, I would know to unmute. All right, are, are you all looking at a PowerPoint? We see it and we're ready for you to hit present okay. and go through. All right. Uh, so we talk about race using a black white paradigm. What do I mean by that? Well, a paradigm is a, a perspective, a framework, a heuristic. It's a way that you, you picture the world and our picture is not accurate. So in 1967, there was the long hot summer across the United States and city after city after city, there was either, depending on your perspective, riots or rebellions. Uh, federal troops had to be called in in places such as my hometown of Detroit. And it was so concerning that the federal government had the Kerner report. They asked Illinois Governor Otto Kerner, would you look into this? And they had a blue ribbon bipartisan panel that issued a report that was stark. It concluded America is not one nation. It is two nations, black and white. A bestseller came out a generation later uh, by a fellow named Andrew Hacker. Uh, he's still teaching, he's in his 90s, he's actually a professor at Queens College where I now am. And the title is Two Nations, Black and White. The Kerner report, is an important document. Hacker's book uh, is wonderful uh, for its time. Both show, and you can see it right in the title, right? Two nations, uh, the way of looking as if everyone fits neatly into just one of two boxes. And I have a very simple point. We don't all fit into one of two boxes. You could be Asian American, you could be Latinx, you could be of mixed background, you could be indigenous. If you have a picture that's just literally black and white, you leave out not one or two, you leave out millions and millions and millions of people. And I say this not out of ethnic pride, uh, but because I want to be true to the facts. My goal is to have a picture that represents reality. I first came up with this idea when I was in college and wanted to write a term paper about Asian Americans and civil rights. I went to the library and looked in the card catalog room. That's how you know I'm old. This is pre-internet, pre-Google. For those of you who don't know, you had to look up books in these chests of drawers that had index cards. I looked up Asian Americans and civil rights. There were no books. It didn't exist. So I wanted to write that book and it came out uh, some years later. But then I realized nobody included Asian Americans. And so I had this idea, race beyond black and white. But then I realized it wasn't my idea at all. You know, every college kid has the conceit. Your ideas are yours. They're original to you. You're unique, right? But it turns out if you look at race, you come across W.E.B. Du Bois, a race man, a public intellectual, a giant, a founder of the NAACP. We owe so much to W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, he had his theory of the talented 10th uh, of those who had achieved a modicum of success, having rights and responsibilities to challenge racial segregation. Uh, he spoke of a dual consciousness, knowing you're American through and through, yet being indelibly black and denigrated for that reason. You could not for a moment doubt that Du Bois was dedicated to the historic struggle for black equality. And inspired by him, I hope that Asian Americans will join the picture constructively 
to build bridges, not destructively to ratchet up tensions. There's a specific line from Du Bois's work. I've put it here. The problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. It comes from his magisterial 1903 collection of essays, The Souls of Black Folk. I recommend it to you, never out of print. When students write a paper and turn into me with this sentence, I realize, hmm, they didn't go back and actually read the primary source, Du Bois' essay, because they haven't quoted the passage accurately. That's not even half the words in the sentence. Du Bois actually wrote this, the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line, the relation of the darker to the lighter races of men in Asia and Africa and America and the islands of the sea. He was prescient, he was profound, and those of you trained in law know those extra words aren't meaningless surplus. They're important. So why do I note this? Because Du Bois, from the very beginning, you couldn't for a moment doubt that he was a champion for Black folk. Yet he situated that struggle within a global context. He thought it was help, not harm, when you pointed out Asia and Africa, America and the islands of the sea. I'm sure he would say men and women today. So there's a whole history of allyship that we've forgotten. Look at this photo from Life magazine in the center. Life was the Instagram of its era, right? It's the pictorial news magazine that your parents or maybe grandparents uh, used to subscribe to. That's Malcolm X dying. He's been shot. It's uh, 1965 in New York City at the Audubon Ballroom. Look closely at the woman cradling his head as he draws his last breath. That's Yuri Kochiyama, who's Japanese. Are you able to blow this up, like so that we can see it in full presentation mode. Like, sure, 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 sure. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, I will make it bigger. And uh, thank you. Here you can see her right at the very top, and there she is at the bottom as an older woman giving a black power salute. The point is, Yuri Kochiyama was what they said then a homemaker, a housewife. She was a, a woman with important responsibilities. Uh, and inspired by Malcolm X, she joined him. She was by his side at all times, working to support Malcolm X. Other than people who study Asian American history, nobody knows who Yuri Kochiyama is, but this is allyship at its best. Take a look at the Japanese American Citizens League, founded in 1929, the delegation they sent to march with the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. under the hot sun in 1963 in Washington, D.C., when he gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. They did have an internal debate. Should we do this? Should we not do this? And they decided, yes, we need to be there. There's their delegation. That's Grace Lee Boggs and James Boggs, uh, their husband and wife, radical labor leaders in my hometown of Detroit. This is not in the history books, but it's real and it's always been real. Allyship was reciprocal. This is Martin Luther King Jr. at Selma. Do you notice something? They're all wearing lays. They're wearing Hawaiian lays. Hawaii had just joined the union shortly before and Hawaiians sent lays because they said, we know that racial integration works. And Martin Luther King uh, and all of those leading this march donned lays because they wanted to show solidarity. People don't know this, but in the 1960s, there was actually a yellow power movement. Can you believe that? And it was expressly modeled on black power. It took its inspiration from its black counterpart. So what's going on with Asian Americans? Two things. The first is we're treated as foreigners. You can be sixth or seventh generation. And yes, there are sixth and seventh generation Asian Americans. There were Asian soldiers in the Union and Confederate armies during the Civil War, if you can believe that, 1861 and 1865. They built the Transcontinental Railroad, the entire Western half. Japanese Americans, 120,000 of them, were locked up in internment camps during World War II, even though two thirds were native born citizens. So at this point, there are a lot of folk, fifth, sixth, seventh generation. They're New Yorkers through and through. They speak English, that's their native language. They, their families convert to Christianity. They're as assimilated as could be. They might even be criticized by their cousins overseas as bananas. Uh, yet, you're asked again and again and again, where are you really from? And there's nothing wrong with saying you're from China. That's what my parents would have said. But I'm from Detroit, and I'm proud of it. I still root for the Tigers. And we only ask this question of some people. 
because other people are just accepted. You get to declare your own identity, but some of us are challenged because the assumption is our hearts belong elsewhere. And we've seen that during the pandemic. Go back to where you came from. Well, when people say that to me, I say, well, yeah, things are getting better in Detroit. So the other uh, aspect of the image of Asian Americans is the model minority myth. You know this, the whiz kid, rocket scientist, overachiever who can do calculus in their head, who went to college at the age of 11 with perfect SAT scores, whose parents beat them for any A minus on the report card. Sounds like a compliment, hardworking, good at math and science, but it's got its problems. The first is it conceals the real facts. Yes, there are wealthy Asian Americans, but income inequality among Asians is greater than among any other group, including blacks. How can this be? Well, it's what social scientists call a bimodal curve. There's a simple graphic. It's a camel with two humps, not one. One of those peaks are people like Vinay's parents, my parents. They come as engineers, they come as doctors, they come in as nurses. So they're, they're at the front lines during the COVID-19 pandemic. Or they come with actual capital, they're, they're wealthy. They can buy a penthouse condo in New York City or San Francisco and transfer wealth from overseas. What's the other peak? Those are the undocumented, they're Uber drivers, they're the wait staff at the all you can eat seafood buffet who their fellow Asians don't notice. So it's a two peak curve. The model minority myth has other problems though. Whitewashes bias so that when Asian Americans stand up and say, wait a minute, we just faced all these crimes until recently people ignored it. Even though Asian Americans are the least likely group in the United States to be promoted to management. That's from a study in Harvard Business Review that looked at Silicon Valley. Asian Americans are overrepresented at the entry level. You look at law firms, accounting firms, wherever you want, lots and lots and lots of young graduates, great credentials, they never get promoted. They're the expendable workforce, the high-tech coolies. The model minority myth also generates racial resentment. Asian Americans are punished for their virtues rather than their vices. What do I mean by that? You're too hardworking. You're showing everyone up. Uh, that's historical. The Exclusion Act was based on arguments such as this, meat versus rice. I, I almost want to laugh when I see this. Uh, Google it and look at it for yourself. This is, of course, before the internet, TV, radio. If you wanted to make a political point, you handed out a pamphlet. What is meat versus rice? The argument is Asian people subsist on rice. White people need to eat meat. That's unfair. I'm not kidding. Now, by the way, that's not true. You know, Asians also eat meat and whites can eat rice. But the argument that this author is making, Samuel Gomper, a progressive leader, is that Asians are superior workers, not inferior, because all they do is just eat rice and they don't have to save up to buy meat. It's really absurd and, and crazy, but it was persuasive. It led to the 1882 Exclusion Act and the 1917 Asiatic Bard Zone. But most of all, the model minority myth is false flattery. It's not about Asian Americans at all. It's a way to talk about the good immigrants compared to the bad immigrants. The Asians are good, the Latinos are bad. It's a way to uh, mock African Americans. Look at the Asians, they made it, why can't you? Using a comparison that's unfair because of the history and the different stereotypes. There's also so much diversity within. Uh, the young lady being lifted in a chair, that's her bat mitzvah, the Jewish coming of age ceremony for women. Born in a Chinese orphanage, she was adopted by Jewish parents. That's not uncommon anymore. There's Charles Mingus, my favorite uh, jazz great. You might wonder, what is that guy doing in Chinese regalia? Is, is he making fun of Chinese people? No, he's respecting his grandfather. He's Afro-Asian. No one ever talks about the Afro-Asian population, the Chinese Jamaicans. Charles Mingus uh, was one quarter Chinese, so he's Afro-Asian. Keanu Reeves, Tiger Woods, also uh, Asian American. And there are so many now uh, who are making these stories known of Afro-Asians and Asian Latinx, the Punjabi uh, Mexicans, for example, of California. I'll uh, close with this. During the pandemic, we've now seen uh, what is happening. People are being spit on, shoved to the ground uh, so hard that they have to go to the hospital in critical condition or in a coma. They're being stabbed, they're being shot. It starts with just the name calling, the common cruelty of childhood, that bullying that I remember well from the playground and it escalates. Maybe it starts just as a simple dispute, but you never know when someone might just snap 
and then come after you. And initially, people wanted to deny it. For example, in Atlanta, that's, a, that's the real turning point. Six of the eight victims were Asian women. The killer confessed. And then the law enforcement officer investigating the case, when I saw this headline, I thought, oh, that's got to be fake news. The law enforcement officer investigating the case said, oh, he was having a bad day, as if to dismiss that it was a hate crime and deny that it was a crime at all. That law enforcement officer, to nobody's surprise, was then found to be spreading the China virus meme himself on social media. Now, as a lawyer, do I know that this was a hate crime? Can I look into this person's heart? No, I don't. So I don't know if the intent was racist, but I can tell you the effect is racial. The 65-year-old Filipino woman uh, who was attacked in New York City in that video uh, that's horrifying, the 30-second video, the most striking thing about the video is not how the perpetrator kicked her in the head repeatedly, brutally, so that she too had to be brought to the hospital. It's that two bystanders watched it all unfold in the last three seconds of this video. What do you see? You see them closing the door. Literally, they close the door on the scene and they walk away. There is so much of this, it's a pattern, it's not random, it would be difficult to deny that there is race at work here, especially since so many of the attackers shout, go back to where you're, you came from, this is your fault, China virus. Uh, in one of the attacks, a Chicana woman on a bus in Los Angeles, who was called a chink uh, before uh, the brutal assault. So it's mistaken identity because people don't bother to check your passport before they attack you. Yet, I'm given hope. I'll close with this. A couple of weekends ago, I went to a rally in Flushing, Queens. And uh, I was honored uh, to be uh, one of the speakers. And as I stood on the platform, I looked at the crowd. When I stepped up to the podium, I said, I've never seen this. I've never seen so many Asian Americans standing up and speaking out, carrying signs, rallying, ready to march for their rights. Never in my life. And I've been doing this my whole life. But as importantly, when I looked at the lineup of speakers, Senator Chuck Schumer was there. Mayor Bill de Blasio was there. Reverend Al Sharpton was there. State Attorney General uh, James was there. The borough president, who's African-American, was there because he was one of the sponsors, along with Congresswoman Grace Meng. I have never seen so many people who are white, black, Latino, Jewish, alongside Asian Americans, calling for an end to the anti-Asian hate. This gives me hope that my father, who came to the United States in the 1960s, like all of us, was transfixed by the trial for the murder of Mr. George, George Floyd, and wanted to say to me as he was watching, and you know, like many fathers and sons, we don't talk about that much, but he said to me, that was wrong. So that was ridiculous what the cops did. And that made me see that my father understands this. And there are Asian Americans joining Black Lives Matter protests. And so many people have reached out to me, friends of mine, colleagues from workplaces long ago, by email and social media to say, I just wanted to check on you. Are you, you doing okay with all this stuff that's happening? Your, your dad okay? That's never been true either. So this nation, beckons with ideals, with principles. That's what drew us to these shores. It's what prompted the great migration of blacks from the deep south to the north, freedom and opportunity. I've had, I have, like Martin Luther King, when he wrote about this in his letter from a Birmingham jail, an abiding faith in these principles of ours. We only have to put them into practice. And that will depend on all of us working together. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes, and, and snaps and those that are on this right now, use your little functions, put your snaps up and your claps in the little, you know, celebration thing. Um, make sure you do that and, and show some love for our panelists. Um, because seeing that history, that coalition building has always existed, is important for us to recognize as we start to look forward to today and our fight for racial justice. Um, and I definitely was thinking about the fact that while we have that coalition building, we also still have the history of the targets on our backs as the others within society. 
uh, that there is that perpetual oppression of Black and Asian Americans that we have that unfortunate solidarity with. Um, and there's a reason why I'm coming to the next panelist as I'm talking about this, because uh, Vinay is going to talk to us about, you know, affirmative action <laughs> um, and, you know, bring us into that part of this issue um, where we stand today as, as Black Americans, as Asian Americans, um, in our fight and our struggle. Vinay. Thank you. Well, Frank is a, a tough act to follow, but he's been doing this longer than me. So, you know, I'm just uh, kind of getting started here. But I'm actually going to talk about uh, some of the things that Frank did and build into affirmative action, taking a bit of a little different frame. You know, Frank talked a lot about why we should be unified, our common struggles. I'll probably focus a bit more on what divides Asian Americans and, and uh, Black Americans and Latinos, other, other people of color. But I will try to, you know, uh, talk about some common ground also towards the end, uh, what we can uh, do to build uh, coalitions. So let me go ahead and share, uh, share my screen. And I do this in class all the time, but I also have, uh, you know, some little issues with, with doing this, getting this to full screen. I know how to do this. Yeah, there we go. Um, okay. So uh, first, what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit uh, from an academic side about a theoretical framework by uh, Professor Claire Jean Kim at UC Irvine, uh, which I think uh, frames uh, one way to frame the relationship between Asian Americans, uh, white Americans, black Americans, uh, you know, people of color. Uh, she talks about what she calls racial triangulation, uh, kind of uh, how Asian Americans are positioned uh, between white and black uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, building off uh, some of the points that Frank made, um, and uh, kind of a really breaks down, you know, the different dynamics that go on uh, here. She talks about this idea of relative valorization, where a dominant group, white Americans in this case, exalts one minority group over another, uh, Asia, exalts Asian Americans, say, over black Americans, as a means to dominate both groups. Uh, so this idea of the model minority uh, kind of uh, uh, comes through that. Uh, and that's accompanied by what she calls uh, civic ostracism. Uh, the valorized group, Asian Americans, is defined as foreign uh, to justify marginalizing them. And, uh, you know, Frank talked about the perpetual foreigner. Uh, so we have both of these uh, dynamics going on here. Uh, and we see this a model minority myth, uh, but also, uh, you know, Asian Americans as perpetual foreigners, which, you know, has taken on a greater prominence uh, since uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. A uh, little bit about the history here of uh, uh, Asian uh, American immigration. Uh, so we had uh, Asian uh, immigrant laborers in the late 19th, 20th centuries, and we saw them valorized a bit. They were considered to be hard, harder, more reliable workers than say black Americans, uh, you know. Uh, but they were also viewed as an economic threat. Uh, there were a number of different violent riots uh, across the West Coast, where many of these uh, Asian uh, immigrants from different countries uh, settled, you had these kind of racial epithets, uh, you know, Chinese, uh, Japanese immigrants being labeled the yellow peril. Uh, and you also had some uh, immigrants from South Asia, uh, uh, India, British India at the time. Uh, they were the hated Hindus. Uh, so this kind of uh, cut across groups, hated Hindu, dusky peril. Uh, as Frank mentioned, uh, this early wave of immigration was ended with the Immigration Act of 1917. You know, we had uh, a lot of things going on in the early 20th century, the Asiatic Exclusion League, uh, and uh, that movement to end uh, immigration was successful, 1917. Uh, but we also know, of course, uh, the Asian American population later grew, immigration uh, later opened back up. And I want to talk about, you know, uh, why that happened, uh, what exactly happened uh, in that whole uh, dynamic. And I saw a question in the chat about how the model minority myth uh, came about. Uh, so maybe this addresses this a little bit. Uh, so after World War II, we know World War II kind of changed uh, the entire uh, global landscape. Uh, we had the U.S. and the Soviet Union as the dominant powers uh, in the world. Uh, we had the Cold War after World War II, the late 1940s, 50s, 60s. Uh, so we had competition between the U.S. Uh, and the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, the Soviet Union was the first into space, the Sputnik satellite. So there was kind of a panic in this country that we need more scientists and engineers uh, to keep up with the Soviet Union technologically. Soviet Union also has nuclear weapons by the 1960s. 
Uh, now, China, India, Korea, other uh, countries in Asia had scientifically trained professionals, had engineers, scientists who wanted more economic opportunities. So the interests of these two groups, uh, you know, uh, Derek Bell, one of the founders of critical race theory, talks about interest convergence. Uh, the interests of these two groups converged with the Immigration Act of 1965. And Frank talked about you know, how this built on the Civil Rights Movement, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, and there's always complex dynamics as to why, you know, we have racial progress. Uh, Derek Bell talks about that. Uh, here, uh, you know, uh, we had uh, educated Asian immigrants, uh, uh, you know, who needed economic opportunities and the U.S. needed more scientists uh, and engineers. So we had, uh, you know, the Immigration Act. And as I mentioned, my father came over on the third preference uh, of that Immigration Act, which uh, uh, favored engineers and scientists. Uh, now, this was just one segment of uh, Asian uh, American immigrants. Uh, if you break this down by ethnicity, you'll see that there's a wide divergence here. You know, and Frank alluded to this, uh, but there's you know wide divergence uh, amongst different groups as to how educated they are. Uh, I believe you know 2019, 2020, about 33 percent of the U.S. population as a whole, adult population, age 25, has bachelor's degrees. And you see there are Asian American groups that well exceed that, but you also have some towards the bottom, uh, the Laotian, Cambodian, Vietnamese who are below that. Uh, so you have this kind of a, a dichotomy bimodal distribution that Frank alluded to, and that's part of the critique of the model minority myth. Uh, but let's talk about what happened after you had this wave of uh, immigration, uh, 1965 uh, Immigration Act. Uh, Asian American population grew a lot after 1965. Uh, and many children of these immigrants, these educated immigrants, they benefited from their parents' educational socioeconomic advantages, uh, being in educated home environments with uh, engineers, uh, you know, as their parents, engineers, scientists. Uh, many became high academic achievers. Uh, and that's kind of where the model minority in its modern iteration uh, came from. Uh, you had a select population of, of uh, immigrants from Asia uh, who were high achievers. Their children became high achievers. Uh, and we know immigrants are not a random set of, uh, you know, uh, uh, not a random population. They, they represent uh, upwardly mobile, ambitious uh, people from their home countries. Uh, so you can think about this as, you know, say if we took uh, the most educated Black Americans in this country, uh, engineers, doctors, and they went to some place where there's not a lot of Black people, you know, like the Ukraine, uh, they would be the model minority in that context. Uh, so you, uh, that, that's the kind of dynamic you had with the uh, Asian American population. And as I said, not all Asian Americans, uh, but a subset there. Uh, now, the model minority is used to justify educational inequity. You know, if Asian Americans can come here, work really hard, why can't other people do that also? This, of course, ignores the very different history of Asian American immigration versus, you know, how Black Americans came here and uh, circumstances of different Latino, Latina immigrants. Uh, so, you know, model minority is a very damaging stereotype. It's uh, used to divide, uh, divide different people of color. Uh, now to kind of get into uh, affirmative action a little bit or kind of the roots of this. So you had this Asian American population boom. By the early 1980s, uh, Asian Americans were enrolling at elite universities in large numbers, uh, you know, being the high achievers, a whole a dynamic there with the immigration. And this led to resentment among white students on these campuses. This is the same time as uh, the Vincent uh, Chin incident that uh, Frank alluded to. Uh, this uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, the model minority is valorization, but you also had this ostracism. You know, these uh, Asian American students don't belong here. You had these epithets that white students uh, levied on the campuses. Uh, MIT became made in Taiwan, UCLA, University of Caucasians lost among Asians. Uh, so you had this resentment uh, among white students, and you also had accusations that you know uh, these elite universities, Harvard, Princeton, didn't want their campuses to become too quote unquote Asian. Uh, you know, that would not be a good thing. That might not be something that their uh, older white privileged alumni like. So, uh, you know, there's this idea that uh, maybe Asian Americans are being discriminated against uh, in favor of uh, white Americans on these campuses. There were investigations of this. The Office of Civil Rights Department of Education uh, did an investigation. Uh, Princeton found, a Princeton study found that Asian Americans were higher uh, academic achievers uh, than average, but they were rated below average on non-academic portion of the admissions process. So you had the stereotype of Asian Americans as these one-dimensional nerds and geeks 
really good at math and science, uh, but socially inept, lacking in leadership skills. And this also speaks to uh, the underrepresentation of Asian uh, Americans in uh, uh, higher leadership management positions uh, in business. Uh, so you had this idea that Asian Americans are being discriminated against with respect to uh, white Americans. And Professor Jerry Kong uh, has called this uh, negative action, uh, you know, uh, in admissions that Asian Americans are, are being discriminated against with, uh, in comparison to white Americans. In the 1980s, you know, you had these allegations, but not much, nothing much really came of it uh, legally. Uh, but negative action is different from affirmative action, which are policies, practices, uh, such as race conscious admissions, which benefit underrepresented applicants in university admissions. And what the current attack on affirmative action really has done is try to conflate these two, uh, try to uh, you know, pit Asian Americans uh, against other people of color by kind of mixing together negative action and affirmative action or allegations, I should say, of negative action and affirmative action. Now, I won't go through the whole legal history of affirmative action because you know, what we're really talking about here is a, a solidarity between uh, a black, black Americans and Asian Americans. So I don't really need to go through the whole doctrine. Uh, I will go to the case uh, that is uh, currently uh, uh, perhaps going to be considered by the US Supreme Court. Uh, there's a cert petition out there. But Students for Fair Admissions, a very ironically named organization, has sued Harvard University contending that Harvard discriminates against Asian Americans in favor of both applicants of color and white applicants. So they mixed the two together. Uh, the first part of uh, SFFA, uh, uh, Students for Fair Admissions, the first part of their case, first part of their brief, focused exclusively on discrimination uh, against Asian Americans vis-a-vis -vis white Americans. Uh, so something that might create some sympathy the second part was an attack, all out attack on affirmative action that benefits black and Latino, Latino Americans. So this is a broad challenge mixing the two together. It's not disputed that on average admitted Asian American applicants have higher grades and test scores than any other group. Uh, so that's not disputed. Why may that be? A uh, number of different possible explanations, these neutral explanations. Uh, Asian Americans are underrepresented in legacy and athletic scholarships. Uh, no longer are they uh, less, uh, uh, <clears throat> no longer do they have uh, less representation because of uh, extracurricular activities. Uh, that was the allegation in, in the 80s that they're very one dimensional. Uh, but in legacy and athletics, uh, you have underrepresentation. Uh, Overrepresented in science and engineering majors, which may require higher test scores. And also some geographic differences. Asian American uh, applicants are more concentrated on the East and West Coast cities. Uh, so, you know, uh, some geographic factors also considered in admissions. Uh, but you, uh, uh, you know, so you have a number of different uh, factors going there. Asian Americans are actually rated higher on, than white applicants on academic criteria and extracurricular activities, except for athletics. Uh, but Harvard also has what's called this personal rating, which uh, assesses character traits, uh, positive personality, uh, uh, leadership, humor, uh, all of these different uh, types of uh, personal characteristics that uh, play to, uh, you know, social skills. Uh, these are the same qualities where Asian Americans were stereotyped as lacking and inferior to white Americans. You know, they don't make as good leaders. Uh, you know, they're not as personable. Uh, so, uh, you know, this raised some other issues. Uh, now, Harvard prevailed in this lawsuit at the district court. Uh, you know, Harvard was uh, perfectly legal in the way it was using race in admissions. It's allowed to do that. And they followed uh, the legal guidelines for that. But the district court judge also said, you know, this disparity between white and Asian American applicants personal ratings has not been fully and satisfactorily explained. Uh, and she thought maybe implicit bias, unconscious racism could be responsible, uh, more likely from teachers and counselors than from Harvard's admissions reviewers. So teachers and counselors may not view uh, Asian Americans as, as personable or, or, you know, having the same social skills. Uh, this is something I can relate to from my personal experience also. You know, uh, being considered a really good student, but maybe not as, you know, uh, socially adept or interesting uh, as some of my uh, peers. Uh, also, idea of school profile differences. Asian Americans tend to go to larger schools uh, with higher teacher counselor ratios. So that means that the counselors don't get to know them as well um, and maybe don't write as strong recommendations. The First Circuit on appeal uh, suggested this could be uh, an explanation. Uh, but the idea of implicit bias is also there. And we know these stereotypes about Asian Americans do exist as socially inept, passive, uh, you know, academically great, but uh, not as uh, good in social skills. Uh, implicit bias, unconscious racism is not legally actionable, but it's still something 
Uh, that's cause for concern if Asian Americans are being stereotyped in this way. Uh, let's see. Uh, where am I here? Uh, okay. Uh, so First Circuit also upheld uh, Harvard's admissions plan. Uh, you know, said the way they're using race is perfectly legal. And as I said, the case is now uh, SFFA has filed uh, a cert petition uh, to the U.S. Supreme Court. We should know in uh, probably the next uh, six weeks, six to eight weeks, whether the Supreme Court will actually uh, hear the case. Uh, and that could, uh, you know, really be bad for affirmative action if the Supreme Court hears the case. Uh, Long-term concern here is just the divisive effect of pitting different groups of people of color against each other. And this is not just affirmative action. You know, I think affirmative action may actually be a bit of an easier case because uh, Asian Americans are well represented uh, on college campuses. But you also have the debate over the specialized high school admissions test in New York City, which may have a much larger numerical impact on the representation of Asian Americans in those schools, has a great impact on the representation of Black and, and Latino uh, students. So that's something I think we really, you know, uh, uh, in the future, we need to talk about uh, as far as relationships between Asian Americans and, and Black applicants and really highlight, uh, you know, the barriers that Black and Latino applicants uh, face uh, in those schools more broadly in our education system. Uh, you know, currently, uh, most Asian Americans uh, favor affirmative action. This is a recent poll uh, uh, that kind of shows the breakdown uh, of different groups. Uh, but, you know, uh, with the divide and conquer strategies, uh, that could uh, change. So last thing I want to talk about is just, you know, uh, maybe give some suggestions what to do about this. Separate affirmative action from negative action. Uh, you know, uh, that those are two different things. Uh, and we want to be clear about that. Reject the model minority stereotype and other stereotypes. And I think more broadly, just think about how stereotypes affect uh, different groups. Uh, you know, uh, um, Certain stereotypes may have a greater harm. I mean, being stereotyped as passive and socially inept is bad. Uh, it's not like, you know, being shot at by the cops, but just the experience of being stereotyped, I think is a common ground. And, you know, that was one of the things that kind of motivated me, you know, I was stereotyped in a particular way, thought about how, you know, other groups, uh, black Americans were stereotyped and, uh, you know, kind of made me relate in, in one way. Uh, so I think that's one common interest that cuts through all of this. Uh, and there are many others uh, you know, uh, many different reasons, the history that Frank alluded to. Uh, but I think, you know, we just need to think about what we have in common and, uh, you know, how uh, how uh, different, uh, you know, how we are uh, pit against each other with all these different uh, divide and conquer tactics. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. You're on mute, Jamaica. Great, because I was stumbling. Awesome. What I said was, thank you. Ah, um, I absolutely uh, appreciate that, Vinay, uh, the, where we're heading with this conversation. Um, one of my favorite little fun facts about affirmative action is that it benefits white women more than it benefits anybody else. So if we're going to fight about something, <laughs> um, let's, again, look at where our commonality is and not have oppression Olympics, right? Um, we're not fighting to the bottom to see where we are the worst off, but where is our commonality to, to move forward and fight against oppression and end those systems and structures that it's harming all of us um, and learning from our personal experiences, right? It's, we have both and, we have the academics, we have the data, but we also have our lived experiences as individuals, which is valuable. It is not something to be sidelined or to be scoffed at. Oh, well, that's just your lived experience. It's important for us to be able to share those things. Um, and, and with that, you know, let's get to our next pa panelist. Uh, Sunu, talk to us about you know, your experience um, and the work that you've been doing. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about sort of how race and gender connect in my work personally and also professionally. But before that, I have to read a poem about affirmative action after that presentation. So uh, we I think we have about 10, 15 minutes. So this should only take a few minutes of that. This is called, um, the title of this poem is called, The Successful Candidate Should Hail from a Well-Regarded Law School. Job posting from March, 2013. And I'm, it starts with a quote from Professor Patricia Williams, who's now at Northeastern Law. There are two schools of thought, 
you should go where you will feel the most comfortable or you should go to a school that will open the most doors. 1992 handwritten letter in reply to mine. This was after I saw her book, um, The Alchemy of Race and Rights at a library when I was working at a camp in Wisconsin. In the weeks before the LSAT in 1993, I walked across the college lawn, my only witness the scent of freshly cut grass. The library opened at eight and for one month, every morning in the two hours before class, I studied for this test that was the key to my future. Classmates complained to my face, you know you will get into law school because you're a person of color. No relatives in this field, I knew nothing about prep classes, no academic counselor informed me of practice exams or asked to review my essay. I used one study book purchased at a bookstore over the summer. Every morning before classes, I sat in the library overlooking the snow covered trees, trying my hands at this, these impossible logic games and math games, these puzzles, these building blocks of arguments, improving my time slowly. Then one morning, the minivan to transport us two hours away to the closest test in Bloomington, Indiana was late. Our tickets read in bold print, no one will be admitted after 8.30 a.m. At 8.30, we sat completely still at a red light on the outskirts of Bloomington. Upon arrival, the registration desk was empty and on the third floor of the campus building, we ran into a kind proctor who had dipped into the hallway searching for his missing five before beginning his exam. The five of us breathless entered the room, filled in our name in little circles and began. And when I looked up, still breathless, after entering my name, the proctor smiled. In 1996, California voters passed Prop 209, a ban on affirmative action. My score reflected the less than ideal circumstances of my testing. I forgot to complete the easy test first and go back to the other puzzles. It was the last test of the season. I ended up where I belonged, a public interest focused law school, one my mother cannot find at the top of the school ranking charts, no matter how hard she looks or how many times she asks me. When I visited Harvard Law and sat on the bench outside the classroom, another prospective student inquired, so when's your essay due to your law school advisor? But I knew of no such person. The only person who read my essay was my father. As for me, my reliance on grace began to be well-practiced. And on some days, I'm still waiting at that 8.30 red light, my chances at well-regarded simply dissipating before my eyes. I wanted to share that poem because it just obviously is on topic, but also, um, with the new administration coming in, I was so disgusted to see, so, I mean, there's so many wonderful civil rights job openings. I was excited to see that, but I was disgusted to see that some of them asked for highly ranked law schools. And I put that on Facebook as I do. And now the ones that I'm seeing just ask for a law school that's accredited, which is fair. So whoever changed that, thank you. Um, you're really closing the door to so many students of color, especially. And it's just, it has really nothing to do with one's capacity, capability, and so on. I want to also talk about um, what Frank mentioned, that social science experiment about who you're connected with in the connection uh, with my personal life, um, being married to a Black woman. And while you're not supposed to marry out of the community, there's definitely a hierarchy. And I put in the post a piece um, this group called Blindian Project that is really trying to create culture change when it comes to who do we count as family and who is literally in our family for many of us and whether or not that's acceptable and how we're treated in connection with that. Um, moving sort of towards more of the legal work, um, I started the Women of Color group in my college because there weren't many of us. And so I became politicized along with others um, as a woman of color and as a queer woman of color. 
And I also was concerned that in the Asian American community, in the South Asian community, there sometimes can be homophobia. And so because of that, I was not running towards that community to be sort of my base community. I was really excited then to connect with organizations like the South Asian Lesbian and Gay Association in New York City, and actually in many, many cities, there are South Asian LGBTQ groups. And those have been so powerful in sort of creating more welcome spaces within the South Asian and AAPI communities. So I want to highlight what others have said about the diversity within our community both in terms of national origin, in terms of sexual orientation, in terms of disability, and in all these other ways that we identify. When that comes to my work as a legal director at the National Women's Law Center, what does that mean? First of all, I wanna share that when um, there was all the attacks and on Asian Americans and going back to with everything with George Floyd, as with many workplaces, we had community groups coming together, identity-based groups. And the Asian American group, we really wanted to do something supportive of the Black employees, but we weren't sure what to do. And we didn't want to sort of create tension around how we did that. And so I think we talked a lot about what to do, and we felt sort of stuck about not wanting to be a burden and not wanting to have another group feel like they have to respond to us. Meanwhile, at my church, the All Souls Unitarian Church, when the attacks happened and the, and the Asian American women were murdered in Georgia, the black men's group sent us an email and it just said, we're here for you, we see you, we know this is painful. And that was so incredibly meaningful. And I share that story to say, we may not always know how to talk to each other across communities and what to say, but don't let that stop us from reaching out because it can be really powerful on a human level. And I really, really appreciated that. So the first thing I wanna share is speak up even if you're afraid sort of in the words of Audre Lorde. And solidarity often comes from exposure, friendships, connections, as Frank said, being around a community and being part of a community is what creates social change, whether it comes to LGBTQ acceptance or when it comes to cross-racial solidarity. So please take opportunities to do that when you get that. Um, the, the other thing I want to say is that the work that we do when we look at hate crimes, or when we look at interacting with the police system. I think the Asian American community has work to do in terms of looking, still looking to the police instead of other places for support. And I feel like if we continue to do that, it will be hard to be in solidarity with Black Americans because this is an institution that is often killing members of this community that we care about and love. And so I think there's a lot of work being done to figure out other ways to get security, whether it's through sort of a community ambassadors, whether it's through education, and also more investments in healthcare, housing, open spaces and parks. I wanna give one concrete example of where that's happened. Again, sort of looking at I also Unitarian Church. They have gone through a few year process to create a new security policy. And that has um, been done in a way that considers if we have sort of someone coming in because of stances we've taken and we feel a threat, is calling the police the first thing to do? And if we do that, who is that putting in danger? And so they've come up with a policy that really has a tiered approach and a much more thoughtful approach about how you create safety. And so I was very proud of um, my church community for doing that. And I'm gonna put that link in here. I was not involved in that. I get zero credit for that. I am just the messenger, but they went through a long process to figure out a safety and a security policy that has what I think more integrity in terms of who you're in community with and who you represent. And 
a similar thing happens with my work. I mean, we're a gender justice organization. And so with issues of sexual assault and sexual harassment, there are some survivors who look to the police system for support. But I feel like we cannot do that reflexively and we have to be extraordinarily thoughtful about how and when we endorse that as, and obviously I'm speaking for myself, um, because does someone going to jail actually help them deal with their anti-Asian bias? Does it help them actually deal with sort of bias against women and, and violence against women? Of course it doesn't. I mean, I was raised Quaker, Society of Friends, and so we're peace activists. We care about restorative justice and we care about actually making change in society and not just locking people up. And so I want to raise these questions because if we are going to be in solidarity with Black Americans, we have to really look at these questions and who we're looking to for safety and security. And so when I saw that there's sort of this now sort of hate crime related piece to the prosecution, I didn't personally celebrate. I do think we need data collection. I do think we need to count how many people are abused and harassed based on their identity. Of course we do, because that relates to what services will be provided. But does that mean someone stays in jail longer? I don't know. I don't know if that solves anything. That's obviously I'm speaking for myself. And so I wanted to raise those questions so that you all can raise them in your communities and think about what you're supporting and why you're supporting it. And I also want to think about representation. I was on a panel recently with um, Carmelyn Malellis, who's the city commissioner of New York City for, for human rights. And she was saying that probably there's more business support for the Equality Act and LGBTQ rights because of representation. And there are more people at higher levels. And the question I have is for all of you in many, many high levels, what are you representing when you're in that high position? Are you only representing, like, am I only representing South Asian lawyer poets? I mean, we're great, but there have to be a broader vision about who we're representing. And when we get into these positions, what are we going to be in, um, thinking about? Think about who's in the room and the positions that are taken. And so on a concrete level, what that means is, you know, this week we're working on an amicus brief about gender justice, and I'm going to name that all of the women who brought this case are Black women, even if there's no race case, because it's important to the story of who brought this case and why they brought it. And I could say that for, you know, any piece of our work that we do. Um, I wanted, before I wrap up this part, um, lift up Deepa Iyer, who talks about sort of movement spaces and who you are in the movement. The way I call that is sort of, we need someone there. So if some, there are people on this call from large law firms, we need you there. You're sort of doing the pro bono work and you're providing funding. And I, I know there's a coalition of big law firms that are supporting racial justice work. We absolutely need people there. And the people who are in corporations who have broadened the laws, civil rights laws and workplace laws, before the laws broadened, you changed how you do business. You made sort of restrooms that are gender non-binary. I mean, there's so many things you did you know, inclusion of transgender folks. There's so many things that need to happen beyond and outside of the law. And you all are the ones doing that in the spaces that you're in. So even if you don't work for a civil rights organization or a gender justice organization, I hope that you count yourself among the people doing the work for social change. And I'm really curious about what the questions will be. So I will leave, um, I don't know if Ali's on and she can put that slide up um, as I think about within the South Asian community and within the Asian American community, there are so many pieces to this. There is caste, there's caste issues, there's colorism. And I wanna thank my friend Marie Varghese, who's, who I see is uh, attending for passing along the website where I found this um, slide. There's so much work to be done within the South Asian community. I mean, I was sitting next to my cousin when she got her arms bleached for her wedding and she's already lighter skinned than me. Like if we come from that, and we come from matrimony ads that say, say fair skin only, think about all the work we have to do about our anti-Blackness. Think about all the work we have to do to not bring that into our workplaces, into our families, into our communications. So as others have said, there's so much that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you, Sunu. Uh, 
we are going to keep it moving, keep rolling, um, because you started to talk about, you know, restorative practices um, and what healing might look like. Um, so Shalana, bring us to that space, right? What is racial healing and what does community building across groups look like? Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, as the non-lawyer in this uh, on this panel, um, I I'm just really honored to be here with you all, um, and I just love the the discussion so far. I feel that you know one of the key pieces of our work at the Truth Racial Healing Transformation in Kalamazoo is where I work is is actually in Michigan, um, and what what we intend to do with the model of truth, racial healing and transformation is connect this super important policy, civil rights, social justice work, right? With this idea that we can change policies, but if we don't change belief systems, if we don't do our work internally and within our community, we're not gonna get what we want to see, right? We're not gonna get all the way there. And so that's kind of the, the underlying framing. I do have some slides, but I think we will, um, I, I'll go through them really quickly and then just, um, just talk a little bit because I think people like dialogue more than. <laughs> So I, I shared, this is a truth racial healing. I always, you know, open with the land and people acknowledgement. Um, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, is which is where I do and lead my work, um, I always want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. Um, and this is the land and people acknowledgement that, um, that we use in Kalamazoo. I know everybody's in different places. Um, but we just think it's so important to ground ourselves in the fact that um, we are on this colonized land, and in Kalamazoo, it is the land, a traditional home of the Anishinaabe, the Council of the Three Fires, Odawa, Ojibwe, and Badawatomi. And so I just wanted to share that with you all, um, even though this is, a, this is a very local context to where I do my work, um, it's so important for me to acknowledge that this is part of the context with which I do my work. The TRHT is really, like I said, to um, envision a world where we are not only seeing ourselves in each other, but also are focusing on building systems that support our own growth and healing overall. Um, this is the framework, just really quickly, the TRHT starts with truth. And we spoke a lot of truth today, which I'm so grateful um, for, um, but really thinking about what is the narrative that we've all inherited about who we are as a society and as individuals and challenge that against the, the real history and truth um, and consistently examining the narrative and examining, you know, what is actually true about it. And I think we've done a, a great job talking about that so far, but it's so critical for us in our work to start with that. And then uh, racial healing, thinking about, okay, well, with this knowledge, we need to build different relationships with each other. And we aren't going to see the world we want to see if we don't do that. So thank you uh, for acknowledging that. Um, and then from there, we really need to think about how to transform all the areas of our lives, um, law, economy, separation. Um, separation really just speaks about how do we, um, how are we maintained and, as a separate entity, as separate communities, right? How are we separated? And, and there was great examples of that today too, of how Black and Asian Americans have been kept separate, both physically and through the narratives about us, right? Um, and so that's kind of the framework of what we do within TRHT. There's, there's several places um, across the country that do TRHT work. So I wanna shout out my folks. Um, and we really look at this concept of where is this hierarchy of human value showing up for us? In what ways do we internalize and reproduce and witness a hierarchy of how we value each other. Um, and we, you know, we have a definition of racial healing. This is really, um, this is really interesting because I think most, uh, most people, when we talk about healing, racial healing, they automatically think we're talking about equity, inclusion work. And it's not exactly that. Um, it's pieces of it, but it's not exactly that. And, you know, I think the biggest piece that we are still stumbling on 
um, and still caught up is is in as a society is this idea that we cannot heal if harm is not acknowledged. Like we can't just move on. There's a big narrative that we we should just move on from everything that's happened and move forward. And that's really not how people heal. Um, and that's not gonna get us where we wanna go. Um, and that happens on an individual and coll collective level. Um, and there's a lot of personal work. I'm gonna talk more about that. Um, but challenging this dominant narrative is so important to what it means to heal and what it means to even do your personal healing work, but also to think about how, what power do I have, right? What power do I have? What decisions am I making? And how in those positions and in those opportunities, am I either reinforcing um, a dominant narrative or am I building towards something different? Um, and to me, that's part of what the accountability work that we're all striving to do now um, is about. And then just recognizing our shared humanity. And there's such beautiful stories already told um, by the other panelists about how they've done that and how they've seen that witnessed is that we all, even though we have very, very different stories, we are all human and we need to see each other in ourselves. So a little bit more about the practice. Um, and we, we always say this just as like more of an action step um, type of idea, but this is not a, this is not something you need to sit back and kind of study, right? This is something that is actionable every day. Um, this doesn't require you to be in a position of, uh, to affect change formally. It does not require you to be a part of a campaign. Um, you can start at home and really start with yourself and your immediate community and the people you're connected to and start to ask yourselves these questions. Um, and what we find is the more we are able to transform our relationship with ourselves and others, the more we're able to impact this policy change and come together. I mean, what a beautiful example of the march um, where we saw that solidarity act. Those comes, that comes from relationship. We wouldn't be able to have that image uh, of um, Dr. King and his associates wearing uh, lays if we did not, if there was not relationships there. And I think oftentimes the relationships are overlooked um, because I think the relationships are really what drives the change. If we can be in relationship with each other, then we can look at, okay, what policies, programs, processes, institutions even, will work for all of us, not just what will work for our community. And, and Suna, you alerted, uh, alluded to that a little. If we're in relationship, we can see ourselves in each other and we can also come up with the best solutions as well. Um, and so that's a little bit about um, how we see racial healing fit kind of a lot of different concepts, but also cause us and challenge us to work in very different ways. Um, I wanted to lift up Grace Lee Boss. I could not decide on which quote I wanted to share um, because she's just so prolific in her work. I had the honor of meeting her in Detroit, um, being in, uh, on the other side of the state in Michigan um, than my other panelists, uh, but um, being connected to the Bog Center there um, over the years, um, she really talks about this. And, it's, and part of our struggle really is deeply, deeply personal. Um, and, and deeply personal in that you have to do this personal transformation and think about uh, how you see yourself in the world and the society. I also love this one because I think it speaks to right now in the moment um, where she said, in the middle of a ca catastrophe, in the middle of disaster, people, particularly people who have already suffered, see the opportunity to evolve into another stage of humanity. And I truly believe that this is where we are today, um, which gives me a lot of hope for our work in the future, even despite the amount of hate that we see every day. Um, I truly do believe that the future really is about how we, as the global majority, see ourselves and see each other. Um, we cannot continue to only focus on how we relate to the dominant culture because the dominant culture is almost not even dominant anymore. We're, we, we're creating a new world. And if we can create it together, how beautiful will that be? And so I just think about in my own work, and I can share a little bit 
Uh, these are my people. These are some of my, my folks in Kalamazoo and we keep racial healing circles um, where we have the opportunity to share stories with each other. Um, and I really recommend there's probably somebody that keeps circles in your community wherever you are. So I definitely recommend this um, for any groups you're connected to um, that you work with. And it really challenges us to A, get to know people that you work with on a different level to see their humanity. Oftentimes we conceptualize this in a very theoretical philosophical way and don't translate it into our bodies and translate it into how we interact with each other. There's opportunities to build, build relationships with people from a different background than you every day. Um, and if you can't do it in person, you could do it online. <laughs> so I would challenge everyone to begin to focus um, attention on um, building relationships and also just thinking about how do we, how do you challenge the narratives that are playing in our mind um, and also on the TV screen usually. So a lot of our work is about challenging that narrative, even working with the no local media, doing social media work to challenge it. Many, many narratives that are going on about all com all racialized communities, right? And how they, they may seem different on the surface, but what's underneath is really white supremacy and that we uh, challenge each other to continue to unpack what that internalized, what how that has been internalized within us as people and within our community. And so that's part of what we do in the racial healing circle. Um, like I said, the, the circle practices are, you know, are un almost universal and traditional, a lot of many traditional cultures. And I know that every community has somebody who keeps circles, um, but uh, I did wanna kind of close, and this is just, I always put people in touch, but um, we do have some resources and I'll share in the uh, chat about uh, ways in which if you need a formal way, I know some of you all may think, you know, okay, but I just want a little bit of a guide. I would love to, to get a little bit more of a, um, some type of formal resource. There's a ton of resources out there online. I have about, three or four that I have links to that I recommend. There's discussion guides um, around how to, how to even start to talk about race within your family, community, network, whoever, because the more we can actually talk openly about this, the more we will be ready to engage with uh, solidarity work and the more we will be ready um, to engage in deep advocacy and policy work. So depending on where you are, you may wanna start with that because it really does start within um, and just understanding that, I think for me, one of my, a couple of my biggest teachers um, and, and a part of, you know, the story I shared in the beginning, um, I had a mentor and teachers in high school and up until this day who were of Asian descent, either South Asian, um, I have a mentor now that's Hmong. And I think um, one of the things that has been so beautiful about, about these opportunities is that we see ourselves as family. That's how we can do this work. We see ourselves in this struggle together. Um, and so one of the things that we've done, for example, is through our work with the TRHG Kalamazoo is to create affinity group healing spaces where we know we have to dig into some of these issues as communities, um, but that's not the end all be all. We can all come together, but if we can dig into these issues of internalized oppression, you know, and, and oppression in general and how these things are playing out right now, real time and have those conversations in a safe space. Again, we'll be more ready. So we have several affinity groups happening right now and it really has allowed us to see how do we, how we, how we personally react to the oppression we face. There's so much similarity and depth to it. And if we can develop understanding um, together, we will be able to work better together um, in the future. So I think that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Shalana. Uh, we have covered so much in this amount of time and thank you to all of the panelists with everything you've shared because uh, there are all of these different parts as we're having a conversation about building Asian American and black solidarity for racial justice, two important words in today's America. I do want to lift up the, the one phrase that had you not already said it, Shalana, I was coming for it next, that when we're talking about the dominant narrative, we're talking about white supremacy. We're talking about the harm that is caused to the vast majority of people in this country 
under white supremacy, and that includes to the vast majority of white people, not based on their race, but for all the other little boxes that were socially created under that structure and system. Um, so now this is that point, right? We've, we've heard a lot with different parts and pieces of this work that is happening, the history, where we stand with affirmative action versus negative action and where we need to move forward, the personal stories, which really I feel were the largest, most impactful part that you all really bring to life where we are in this work right now um, and that we do need that healing and we cannot move forward if we are not recognizing and acknowledging the harms of the past, right? That accountability is very necessary. Um, I do know that we have at least a couple questions that have come into the Q&A uh, that we will open up for individuals that would like to answer. The first one, um, how do we address policies that seemingly pit Asian Americans against Blacks, such as admission to New York City specialized high schools, which actually wasn't my question, but as an education advocate for more than 20 years, one that I was already holding on to. So if anyone wants to jump in and, and talk about that. You know, I guess I should say something because I mentioned that directly in my presentation, although I'd really be interested in what, you know, Sunu and, and Shalana have to say about this, because I think that is even more than affirmative action, you know, that's going to, you know, the, just looking at the percentage of Asian American students in the magnet schools in, in New York and what taking away that test uh, would do numerically, you know, affirmative action, uh, Asian Americans are well represented if, you know, uh, whatever uh, happens there, uh, you're gonna have, well, good representation of Asian Americans. But I think, you know, I think it's really about, you know, framing this around, you know, what you said, the idea of white supremacy, how does all of this, uh, really reinforce white supremacy. I mean, one of the interesting things here uh, about Asian American students, you have this phenomenon, which is, you know, you can dub it like the new white flight or a different type of white flight. When the number of Asian American students in a particular school district reaches a certain level, white folks leave because they're like, you know, these Asian American students are gonna outcompete our children. You know, uh, you know they're gonna get all the elite spots. So think about that in relation to what's happening in New York uh, with the test in relation to affirmative action. And I think really get Asian Americans to think about that. I think how it's part of the broader narrative, but let me stop and you know, see if they have anything. Are there other folks that want to chime in when we're you know, looking to address the policy of, it says seemingly, but I mean, we, we know what that looks like that admission process in New York City specialized high schools. Sunu? Yeah, I mean, the thing that comes to mind is, you know, when I visited my relatives in India and there were what they call set-asides for Dalit folks and sort of some of them were um, reacting to that as if to say, well, this is going to take away our slots. And there's this like mindset of if others who are harmed, you know, for generations have opportunities, then it means less, quote unquote, less for us. And I think this is when folks' integrity does come into question. I, mean, I, I saw all these articles where, you know, Asian American business owners, like during sort of a lot of the um, protests, like even if they had their window like broken in, they were like, I can replace this window. Like people are being killed. And so even if your stuff is at stake, where is the integrity? And I think that's a really hard question and each person has to answer that on a daily basis. Like, what are you going to be about? Uh, Shalana, I don't know if there was something you would want to share as well. Um, I'll, I'll add, uh, again, education advocate for more than 20 years here in New York State um, and actually currently suing New York State for underfunding our schools, um, specifically in my hometown. We know that those standardized tests are racist to begin with. Um, so it's not simply enough to look at and say, oh, well, is this something that's trying to pit Asians uh, against you know, the, the black community, but how the system in and of itself is problematic. Like the symptom I think of seeing, oh look, they're using it as another tool to try to divide people of color to divide them amongst themselves so that they don't unite against the harmful tactics that are used in general. Like, let's look at it holistically. Are these tests really helpful 
to the students overall. The fact that there is any disproportionality is just a symptom. So yeah, the, the way to address those policies, and I feel like Vinay spoke to this a little bit, is about our solidarity. That we come together and say, yeah, these tests are, are bad in general, because it is also going to perpetuate that model minority myth that then disadvantages those Asian families that are living in poverty or their students aren't the best in math and science. I've had friends say to me, Jamaica, I suck at science. I just want you to know. I don't want you to ever ask me. And I actually was appalled because I'm like, oh my gosh, do you think I would? And then, it's, you know, it's a whole conversation, you know, black women, Asian women, no, we're just joking. But like, this is the world we live in, right? So how is it that we continue to move forward? And I know in a little bit, you all are gonna take time to tell us what are actionable items we can do, right? Cause that's a really important part of this conversation. Not for us just to talk in hypotheticals or reflect on things we've learned, but what is it that we do moving forward? There are a couple other um, questions that have come in and, and thank you to those that are participating because that's what we need. We need full participation. Uh, so one question, um, BIPOC undertake a great load in raising racial issues in the professional workspace, all the while suffering and coping with death, suffering, oppression individually and collectively. How are ways we can quote unquote incentivize our white colleagues, counterparts to prioritize and promote AAPI uh, Black American social issues without making the incentive itself the focus of their contributions? That's a really long question, but I'm I'm looking forward to hearing what y'all got to say. Shalana or Susan? <laughs> I mean, I can start with um, what we value, you know, for I was at EEOC for 15 years. And, you know, when we settled a case, we would say, okay, you need to do training on sex harassment, you need to have avenues for complaints, sort of what are people getting trained on and not in a check the box way, but in a sort of discussing hypotheticals and how do you have courageous conversations? How do you interrupt racism when it shows up? in a micro way or in a more direct way in your workplace. You have to practice that, it's hard. And, you know, a friend of mine, she went to HR about sex harassment that was going on for like months and months over Zoom and they asked the man to leave and that is unheard of. And, you know, she's saying that's because of me too. And I was like, it's because of me too, but it's because of you. Like you went there and you risked that. And it was not a low level person. It was someone who was gonna be like her boss's boss when he got promoted. And so the courage to do that and to practice how to do that, but in terms of employers, are you, are you evaluating your managers based on how they address issues of diversity and inclusion? Like, is that something you value in your workplace? Are you putting money into actual training with people who are competent, who are coming in and having discussions of hypotheticals about how to interrupt racism? Or are you doing a check the box? And so obviously I can talk at length about EEO and diversity and inclusion and training and what works and what doesn't, but just what are you putting attention to? What are you putting money towards? I think those are some of the questions that I think about. Delana. Uh, yeah, thank you. Oh my goodness, the workplace, the workplace. Um, right, so I'd say there, there are a ton of, of um, guides out there that are like, what can you do? Like basic changes that folks can make, but it, you're right, it is, usually on the people of color in those organizations to even present those tools, right? And so one of the things that I've seen work effectively um, is um, promoting within these affinity groups and within some of the, this work, um, actually doing that work of building relationships with white allies who can help and real allies. I know that term is now is used, but uh, I think I know you know you all know what allies, accomplices, well, with the folks that uh, are ready to speak up and really work side by side with with those folks within your organization. Again, back to the relationship building because there's so many tools and consultants and 
you know, blogs and everything out there, uh, research about best practices for the workplace. It's out there. The information's there. It's just about having, building the will to make changes um, and actually putting time and resource and energy into making changes. Now, a lot of people are hiring a DEI director, diversity, equity, inclusion. There's a new job posting I see every day about new DEI positions that local and national companies, international companies, et cetera, et cetera. And I always ask the question, what is this person's budget? (laughs) Like, do they have a budget? Are they going to have staff? Are they going to be responsible for 10,000 people's um, diversity issues solely as an individual? And so that's another dynamic I'm seeing. So that work just has to be resourced um, because you have to have people who have some actual knowledge about how this stuff works to implement um, and pull the piece together and you have to have will. Um, I know there's been some great within, I work at a community foundation and within the work at the community foundation, um, we do have something called the anti-racism transformation team that works focused on internal issues. Um, But really, I mean, it had been a lot of people of color who would champion to get that in place. But once we're able to get that in place, there is a model for building that allyship with white folks who are going to actually continue to advocate for how this all this stuff rolls out. So um, but again, it it is the I believe that uh, relationships are the foundation and and identifying who you can lean on in those um, in those moments when, you know, we don't want to always have to carry that load. So that's what I would share. (laughs) It's hard work. It's so hard. It is hard work. The other thing that I want to kind of lift out of that question was it talked about incentives, right? Like this idea of how do you incentivize for for white folks to show up? Um, and I've gotten to a place where, um, so my organization is called All of Us, right? For a reason. It's not one of us. It's all of us. Um, and that I, I'm trying to push away from the word called allies. I'm looking for freedom fighters and they come in all shades, shapes and sizes. Um, and that there are skin folk that are not kin folk and just cause you're brown don't mean you're down. And like all of those other things that we have to recognize. Um, and there's this woman, Lila Watson, um, and I'm gonna get the quote wrong because I'm not looking at it right now. But she specifically says, if you're here to save me, I don't need your help. But if you come because your liberation is tied up with mine, then let's do the work. And that is true of other people because we are all living under systems and structures that if someday your existence could profit somebody else, then you are expendable also. Um, And to make those conversations accessible inside the workplace. Lean into being uncomfortable. My partner says it all the time, get comfortable being uncomfortable. That means in our workplaces, it means in our schools, it means in our houses of worship, it means wherever we exist in life, that we need to make that a a priority for us to be able to move forward and to have solidarity to create change um, in the world that we're in right now. Um, I know we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in. I know we're not gonna get to all of them because I really wanna be respectful of the time of our panelists, as well as those that are joining us um, through Zoom. Um, There's one specific to lawyers as the other non-lawyer on the call. Uh, How do we encourage employers or law firms to hire non-traditional students, such as night students? I think that really goes right into the question of, well-regarded law schools, highly ranked law schools, right? As more of us get into hiring positions, what are we looking for in applicants? What are we looking for in candidates? And, you know, there's so many ways to, you know, actually have someone perform, you know, write something that's on topic. Like you can assess people's credentials in so many ways separate from the ranking or like if they went to school at night or in the morning, like that has nothing to do with someone's ability to be a good lawyer. And we know that, but we take these shortcuts. We take these shortcuts that are discriminatory 
and it has to stop. And more and more people who get into those hiring positions, the more we can look at candidates as a whole and make sure you have candidates of color, make sure you have women, make sure that you have the people at your organization who will be able to do the work and meet with the clients and sort of bring that wealth of, of experiences and, and expertise to the job. And so I, I think that's absolutely right. And obviously if someone is going as a night student, it's probably because they there were many reasons in their life that led up to that. And those very things will make them a better lawyer. And you know that. And so don't let those things sort of get in the way to anyone who's in a hiring position. There is a follow-up question, um, and it's probably going to be the last one we get to because uh, I want to make sure y'all get a couple minutes to talk about what are some resources and actionable items. Um, what are some ways legal aid organizations can re retain Black attorneys and people of color? I guess I'll just say a little bit, uh, but you know, I I almost want to defer to Sanu about this because you know she has a lot of great insights, uh, and you know I'm in academia; she's more in practice, uh, so you know uh, that makes sense. But I think you know, uh, I mean, people's financial situations have a, a big impact on that. You know, just uh, all the student debt that uh, young lawyers have to worry about. You know, really, uh, all people you know that have been higher education. So I think trying to alleviate that, you know, kind of a broader policy, you know, of alleviating student debt would allow more people who want to do that kind of work. Uh, to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know what the precise issue there is. I know legal aid um, attorneys work incredibly hard and are, are not paid corporate salaries, um, probably have, you know, really high caseload. I know many, many organizations as, as we are, we have a union now, and I'm excited to see like what they're going to bargain. Um, and that will, you know, really improve the organization for everyone. And so I think, you know, especially those of us who are doing workplace justice work have to be sure that we're modeling what we are fighting for. And that sometimes that's a process. I mean, are you putting salaries in your position descriptions or are you per perpetuating discrimination and paying people based on sort of what they were paid in the past, which perpetuates discrimination? Like you should put a salary in the posting. I'm giving that as an example of how we need to live our values and live the things that we're advocating for. So I would say at each organization, what those specific things are will be different, but I would say sort of work together with others who are there and come up with how can this organization retain more of its employees and think about what those demands are and ask for them because I think that's really powerful work and part of our work. And I just want to- Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say, you know, I think for legal aid, I'm, I'm not in legal aid, but in the professional sphere in general, and especially in anything nonprofit, government related, social service related, um, this is a question, right? And I think it speaks to the last question too. What is your organizational culture? What is it like to work there for people of color? <laughs> like that is a big question. I think it's in, in addition to the financial pieces and um, the burnout is really real, especially if you're the person of color who is um, also has experienced some of the issues that you're working on as a person of color and may be experiencing microaggressions or unfair treatment in the workplace and expected to maybe unconsciously perform at higher rates. And you might be dealing with all three. And I think that's uh, a big thing. And I know in philanthropy, that's a conversation. It's a conversation in nonprofit. Um, I would say across the board, probably. So just looking at the culture and practices um, is really important. I'm gonna say something incredibly radical. Talk to your employees who are black and people of color. Literally ask them and then be willing to hear them and accept what they say and don't be dismissive. Don't um, <laughs> don't be defensive, which, which can be trying. Um, don't sit back and say, oh, well, no, that didn't actually happen. And don't then go back and have those conversations, what you think are out of their earshot with anybody else. Don't later say to somebody else, oh, they said this, but I know it's not true. Don't, don't do those things. Um, and be active 
and creating change based on the conversations that you had. Assume that there is something wrong within your organization and that change needs to happen. That would be my, my personal advice um, as a social justice warrior. Um, I Now I wanna take the time um, for our panelists to, if there are other actionable items that you want to share or to lift up that you've already shared in the chat, um, I wanna start with you, Shalana. Um, are there things that you've already shared or, or things that, what can people do? What's the next step for them? Yeah, thank you so much. And I do have to hop off, um, but this has been wonderful. And thank you for everything you've, that you've added as well. Um, I, I shared a few links in the chat. Some of them are um, resources to take action, um, of racialequitytools.com, um, discussion guides, there's writing prompts just for that personal place to get started. Sometimes it, it really, I think it, it really is um, something that you can kind of enter into yourself if you feel called. And there's a lot of things you can do yourself, you know, in your free time to, to think these things through. Um, so I shared some resources about that in the chat already. And I don't know if the organizers will share that out. But yeah, I love this last piece of the discussion just about really starting with where you are. Um, and the piece I, I know that got lifted up just now about listen, actually, actually listening, like really, really just listen. Sometimes the answers are right in front of your face, but the dominant narrative won't allow you to act or see it. Um, and so uh, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thank you to my panelists. Um, and yeah, I can go ahead and try to share a few more resources in the chat. Thank you for that, Sunu. I'll keep it very brief. Um, we at the National Women's Law Center send out a lot of action alerts on a range of gender justice um, issues. So you can sign up at the National Women's Law Center and WLC.org. And also I'm on the board of the Transgender Law Center. Please check out their website and learn about all the work in terms of all the attacks on trans folks and our need to be in solidarity on that front as well. And I also put in a link to Split This Rock, a social justice poetry organization, and you can sign up to get a Friday poem every week, uh, which you will appreciate and it will inspire you with the work. Thank you for that. Vinay. I think I'll kind of conclude by taking us back to where we started with all of our uh, personal stories. And I think, you know, uh, in addition to listening uh, to employees, listening to, you know, people of color, I think that's very important. And I think, you know, the point's been underscored, but just that process of self-reflection, I think we heard was important to all of us. And I would encourage, you know, all of you, uh, anyone uh, interested in these issues to do that. Uh, to see the struggles you've had, to also see the privileges that you've had. And I think that helps us understand these struggles uh, and privileges of, of, of other people also. So, you know, uh, I think all of us kind of talked about how it started, you know, with our own experiences with us. And I would, I, I think that's a model also. I think everyone uh, can do that. I try to encourage my students to do that when I'm teaching race and law. You know, think about your own experiences uh, with race. And that, of course, goes with uh, gender, sexual orientation, all of these uh, identity categories where some of us are more privileged uh, than others. I would add to that, look for the other opportunities to continue these conversations, to go to workshops. Um, all of us community action group, our, our mission is to support and strengthen marginalized communities in the fight for black liberation and an end to all forms of racism, oppression and exploitation. And we do that uniting people across those socially created divisions that we're fighting for in this conversation today. Um, thank you so much to everyone that's joined us, the panelists, um, the individuals, the hundreds of people that we're watching on Zoom and on YouTube. Um, we encourage you to check out the other webinars in the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month web series. Um, there's a link to the web series page in the chat where you can find additional information on these programs. We'd like to express our gratitude to the esteemed group of panelists. I can't say it enough. Um, I always show up in space knowing that I'm going to learn something. I learned even more today than I could have possibly imagined. Like personally, thank you so much. Um, you are all doing critical work and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to be here and share your personal experiences with us today as well as your wealth of knowledge. Uh, the section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. 
We hope this helps you in your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming active in the ABA. You may do so at, I'm gonna just, it, we're gonna put it in the chat. Um, it's ambar.org backslash CRSJ. Um, everyone be well. Um, and as I say, in every space that I go to, be sure to drink water, take care of yourselves, but also take care of each other. Enjoy the